good morning. Uh, my name is John Kiefer from Material Science and Engineering, and it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Professor Peter X. Ma, uh, the uh, Richard H. Kingery Endowed Collegiate uh, Professor of uh, Biologic and Material Sciences of, uh, um, of Macmillan, sorry, of, uh, of biomedical engineering, of material science engineering, and of uh, macromolecular science engineering. Um, uh, his research is in the areas of biomaterials, tissue engineering, and regenerative medicine. Um, he has uh, close to 300 uh, uh, scientific papers published, and um, several of them are signed, uh, cited about a thousand times. Uh, so he has made a great impact on the field. And from a uh, um, material science point of view, uh, what's remarkable is that uh, the advancement that he has provided us with uh, in understanding the interactions between the living uh, cells and synthetic materials. Uh, for example, he has um, uh, pioneered um, a biomedic uh, scaffold uh, in which uh, cells and tissue can uh, regenerate. He also has developed uh, delivery systems of uh, various, um, for various biologic, bi biomolecular agents that are responsive to the environment that they arrive in and release uh, uh, selectively. He has received a number of distinctions, and I'm only going to summarize, highlight a few of them. Um, he has been named one of the top uh, 100 material scientists in 2011 by Thomson and Reuters. Uh, he is a fellow of the uh, American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering, a fellow of Biomaterials and Science Engineering, a fellow of the Materials Research Society, and a fellow of the American Association of Advancement uh, Science. And today he's going to talk about materials for uh, fish engineering. So th thank you. Does this work? Yeah. I didn't use it. You didn't use it? Works, yeah. I hope you can hear me from the back. Is that it that's works, okay? Yeah. All right. Good. I hope this room is designed for the sound effect. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but anyway, so thank you, John, for the uh, very uh, kind introduction. And I thank the organization committee, especially Richard, for organizing the details for the arrangement uh, as well. And uh, so this was a great opportunity for me to speak here because I'm a, a faculty member in the material science and engineer. And uh, they also see that I'm spread over all different places, quite stretched uh, with uh, a variety of things. But I want to start with uh, acknowledge uh, uh, the, the people in the laboratory because they are the people who really did the work. But the, the people in the labs keep changing. And uh, so we have uh, about 35 or six uh, uh, people now as faculty members in other universities. And uh, so they're doing well. So I get a lot of competitions as well. And uh, uh, these are the people who are working on it. But uh, also there are new people come in. Some of them graduated recently. And I also have to acknowledge uh, uh, many collaborations. So, uh, through the university and outside and other countries, so all uh, over the places. But one of the things that uh, John introduced, I'm working on tissue regeneration. So this issue is that there's so many people have issues with tissues or organ loss, uh, either due to disease or trauma, a variety of reasons. There's just not enough tissue to be able to replace them. So this story, so it kind of uh, goes through this story that uh, many years ago. So I finished with a PhD degree in polymer sciences. Uh, and actually in the material science department. Then I was thinking what I'm going to do. And uh, so I was thinking the polymers can be fibers, they can be rubbers, the plastics, just didn't uh, excite me that much. I'm thinking of the applications. It could be tires, it could be trash bag, it could be a variety of things you can do. And then I thought maybe something for medical application, help people maybe cure diseases. Now this time there came this advertisement from this group. It's Bob Langer, Joseph McKinney, and MIT and Harvard. They're looking for people that have some polymer background, but into biomedical sort of application and regeneration. So, so I look at this paper. So this is Bob Langer, Joseph McKinney, two people and when I was a professor in MIT, when I was in Harvard Medical School, published a paper called Tissue Engineering in Science. Now, read this paper. Uh, 
there's not much uh, results in there. And uh, I really admire people who publish in science or nature, but especially uh, admire those people who don't, who don't have data to publish in science <laughs> and nature. And, uh, I was very excited reading through this, but th this is a figure web. You see, there's something to describe what they're trying to do. So that if you want to regenerate bone, what do you do? You get cells from bone and put it into porous materials. Then those cells will grow into bone. Then the materials eventually degrade. Then you get a bone regeneration. But if you want to grow cartilage, what do you do? You put chondrocytes, the cells in the cartilage into these materials, then they grow into the tissue. And if you want to grow liver, what do you do? You get hepatocytes, the cells in the liver, put into materials, then this material eventually degrades, but the polymer will form, and the cells will form that tissue. So it sounds very exciting, it can grow everything. But just that time, they didn't provide much data in this paper. And uh, then I was excited about that, so I started working with them. And luckily, uh, they, they chose me to, to work with them. Then the first thing I did was that they asked me to, I, I talked to Bob Langer, I said, what am I going to do as I come here? He said, you probably, as a polymer guy, can make some fibers. Fibers might be something uh, cells may grow. Uh, now this was a machine I set up at MIT. So I bought a few pieces of things and uh, then made some pieces myself and then put them together, uh, becomes the extruder to put polymers in there with very small quantities, like uh, a few grams, to be able to extrude through that tiny extruder that goes through the different rows, the control temperature, the speed of the rows by rotating, stretch them into fine fibers. Then in such a way, use the, the polymer people's capability, you know, every week synthesize a few grams of polymer to do fiber process. And uh, so then you eventually made some fibers and fabric uh, sort of materials. So this is called the PGA now woven scaffolds. So, I like golf a lot, but this has nothing to do with uh, uh, golf. And uh, so this biodegradable polymer, that this fibrous structure. And uh, then we did a show that we put the copper size in there, the polymer eventually degrade, they form tissues like this. Cell, so make matrix over time, they have more and more matrix, eventually form this called cartilage. The look at outside, you see it's a shining sort of cartilage formation. So it was a very exciting period of time. And, uh, but the cartilage quality at that time was not that great. Only got 40% uh, of the mechanical property of normal cartilage, but people thought my data was too good to be true. 40% was too good to be true. Uh, but anyway, it was published because we have a good control and so forth, statistical analysis. Uh, so those are so a variety of areas I worked with uh, a few of those people, pioneers that uh, at that time also like postdocs or, or fellows working with me together. So I'm the polymer guy, they're also medical doctors. Uh, and so we uh, published in a variety of areas. Basically those are three years as a postdoc, uh, I worked with these people together. We we prove that concept was true. So you truly can put the different cells into the materials and the grow into tissues. Then this becomes really exciting because uh, then they were reported on TVs and a variety of uh, newspapers. And then that time I was looking for a job, uh, after three years looking for a job. So I think those things actually helped me because then I looked for a job, Michigan offered and many other universities offered. So I, so I looked around, I thought Michigan was the best place and with all this uh, different uh, biomedical and also especially the medical school, dental school. Dental school is number one ranked in the world. The, the medical school is top 10 ranked. The engineering is also a top uh, four or five ranked at that time. And so it was very exciting. So I moved over here. Then the concept was using cells to repair tissue, use cartilage to repair cartilage and so forth. Then you think about it, but before you repair a lost tissue, you need to get the cell or tissue from the patient. This is not something easy to do. It's not easy to do multiple surgeries. Before you repair tissue, you first uh, create a defect in the patients. This is not easy to do. But excitingly at that time, when I moved over here, this already many years ago, right? And uh, the stem cells, 
becomes exciting. It's a new era. People start to be very excited about stem cells because stem cells can grow a lot. You can make an infinitive sort of cells, and also they can grow into any tissues. That's very exciting. You can grow any tissue. So you don't have to harvest the cartilage to repair cartilage. You don't have to har uh, harvest the livers to repair liver. You really use the stem cell, can do everything. So this was the excitement. But what's, what's the problem with stem cell? Actually, it's exactly the same. They may grow into any type of cells or any type of tissue. So this one time, this famous philosopher said that life is like a box of chocolate. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. They can grow into anything. It may not be what you wanted. The our lab was started trying these ideas to see how to use materials to build this micro environment to control cells or guide them into the directions you want. Just like if you want to tell somebody, go here to Chicago, and uh, if there's no road, you're just going to be randomly walking around here with all the roads circling around. But if there's a kind of highway and you are in that tunnel, you have to go there and to try to build that. So we're trying to build materials that magically turn them on. And uh, so they are also involved in the delivery system as well. But this is one of those uh, papers I published in, uh, uh, those couple of papers in uh, review journals, it's, uh, Advanced Drug Delivery Review. But at that time, there's no such a journal called Advanced Tissue Engineering Review. So you have to publish in you know, Advanced Drug Delivery Review. And then, then we have these uh, materials that I described there. So materials can do a lot of different things. Like you have these pores that allow cells to grow, but at the same time they need to be connected so cells can migrate through one pore to another. Or the blood vessels can grow because those are very important for good tissue formation. The, the, the cell size and so forth are all affected by those pores. And the down scale to the nanometer scale, then those materials need to be nanofibers similar to the collagen and the extracellular matrix in the body to help cells grow better or form better tissues. Then we also need to have like ligands and so forth that can in interact with the cells as well as we need to have biomolecules to be delivered to the cells like uh, you know, uh, <coughs> Dr. Larson mentioned, so you can help those stem cells Go grow into what you want. So, as I mentioned, the materials, the molecules, all those interactions try to control them. So, the first thing I did was here at the University of Michigan. So, because people confuse that, Peter worked out with some fibers. So, those nanofibers were developed in MIT. This is also actually University of Michigan. So, we developed a way called phase separation rather than use those extruders. Because extruders only can make microfibers, not nanofibers. So, we tried to mimic this collagen. This nanofiber structure, then we developed this way called phase separation. Uh, phase separation we already know, so, but uh, use phase separation to make nanofibers. Put polymer solution into certain sort of environment, change the concentrations, temperature, then they turn into nanofibers. And this was uh, the way we did it. So that in certain way, they were self assemble into the nanofiber similar to the natural extracellular matrix. And, uh, this was very exciting for us because we published a paper in a journal with the impact factor of two. <laughs> because that's time the bio materials. This is the number one journal, bio materials, and uh, this was an, uh, two. But this was cited like uh, around the thousand times. So. And uh, this uh, was starting. But the issue was that this is very exciting nanofibers, but cells just don't grow in there. The issue is. There's no holes in there. You, you, you look at those sides, the pores are so small, much, much smaller than the cells. They will never be get, able to get into there. Then we started another sort of a way to try to get cells in there. So I started thinking how to dig holes into these materials to allow cells to grow in there. And so I write proposals to an edge. An edge look at it and say, no, we never support the material sciences. <laughs> it's very clear, never going to support the material sciences. And, but I thought this was very important for them. And so I started to dig them anyway. So the way, of the way we dig them was 
uh, that time, because I didn't really have much money. NIH didn't want to support me. NIH thought I was doing too much uh, uh, biology in there uh, and so forth, although they uh, get good uh, scores. Uh, but anyways, so I told the students, buy a bag of sugar in the supermarket so, so we can start working with holes. So then we kind of melt those sugars, so stretch them into some longer fibers, then assemble them this way. Uh, so that time I had only one postdoc, no graduate students in the laboratory. So he was the one doing all this. So stretch them, put them together. So then you actually pour the polymers on them. Then they form this sort of nanofiber structure. Afterwards, we put this whole construct into water. Then those sugars will dissolve away, but the polymers didn't. So then we get this interconnect channels. Then he becomes very good at this. Then he can turn this at different angles and so forth. So you have perpendicular channels or parallel channels and so forth. So by the way, so we call that self-assembled scaffold because it was totally assembled by himself. <laughs> <laughs> So this is materials that we are able to use cells to grow into these sort of 3D structures, but that was the channels. Then there was a, this a graduate student that came to my lab of macromolecular size. He was thinking of spherical pores. Then we start to make some spherical uh, sort of particles so then assembled in a mold. This can be any shape. It can be ear, it can be nose, and then melt them a little bit. You increase the temperature, they stick together, they form that 3D structure, and then cast the polymer in there, eventually form this nanofibers and materials, then dissolve away those initial particles. Then you get this interconnected three-dimensional uh, pores, like those ones. So then we start to make the interconnect pores with higher magnification, you see the nanofiber structure on the walls of the pores. When cells can get in, then they interact with the extracellular matrix like uh, sort of materials. And then further, we develop a way to use 3D printing. So computer can print any shape, any uh, size sort of uh, uh, structures. And then we design these sort of things. And then with polymers, uh, kind of poured into them, then eventually dissolve away those are uh, initially printed materials, and then we get this interconnected 3D structure. It can be more complicated than those spheres or channels and so forth. And then further, we can print them into any shape or size. Now recently, I think tissue engineering has become hot to use a lot of uh, 3D printing. So this was something we did uh, uh, years ago. And uh, then we just can make any shapes. Then we can make the geometry, macro scale, the micro pores, the nanofibers, all in this sort of uh, 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 we are casting process. You can make ears, you can make fingers, uh, any shape. The, one of the things we were thinking was, if this was truly good, the nanofiber was making any difference in there, then that time came this uh, uh, postdoc, uh, Ken Mi Wu, and uh, she was fantastic. She had the background in bi ball biology, and uh, she had her own grad to come to the United States, otherwise I would not be able to support him, <laughs> support her. So this everything just came very lucky for me that she came and uh, with the Korean government support. Uh, and, uh, then she did this surgery on these animals, make the defect, put the materials in there, and you see that with this nanofiber structure, a lot of new tissue formation in there, and also more sort of mineral formation as well. And this indeed show this nanofiber mimic this extracellular matrix materials lead to better tissue formation. Then we try to ask why that was the case. Then she talked to me about it. I said, okay, uh, nanofiber is much thinner, so they have higher surface area, so proteins absorb better, so we get better cell growth. She was happy with that. She showed me the data. Indeed, this was improved. Then the second time she came back and said, Peter, that's proteins, not only the, the amount was increased, but different proteins actually absorbed on them. Then she showed me, you see, some of the proteins is very similarly, uh, this nanofiber or the smooth materials, but for some of them, only are the nanofiber, like those, and those proteins actually affect cell adhesions, like fibronectin, vitronectin, and so forth. 
So in some way, we mimic kind of big structure, the nature, actually, those cells have laid out those right protein, you interact with them, help cell adhesion. Now, John Hu that time came to my lab, they found those protein indeed affect cell adhesion. You see, the cells are this uh, uh, flat surface stretch like this, all the uh, nanofiber structures, they have a different uh, morphology. Then, furthermore, those different morphology lead to different gene expression level. Now you see, both cell protein is very important for bone formation. The, the expression level, level of the nanofiber was 100 times higher than the flat surface. The exact the same polymer, polylactic acid materials, but the weak nanofiber, the gene expression go up 100 times. And remember that first time he got that data, said, Peter, I did something wrong, so I will repeat the study. So the second time, again, did something wrong, because again, it's 100 times. The third time, he said, maybe it was not wrong. <laughs> so this was, uh, we did up, then we found this uh, truly nanofiber can affect gene expression of the materials that lead to studies we found out there was some mechanism related to really rock signal pathway at all. Also recently, we found it related to like a YAP pathway and so forth. So then we tried to prove those pathways was true. Then we have inhibitors that can rescue the gene expression as well. So this proof that was kind of a, a true. Then that time, then we start thinking, this nanofiber can increase osteoblastic sort of a differentiation of the marker gene expression. Maybe then we can put this sort of materials with the cells or turn those stem cells into ball rather than other direction. Now I got a grad, uh, graduate student excited, was Laura Smith, and she thought, wow, you can use materials to turn tissues. But, uh, Again, this was a trick because we were not able to. I just told her this potentially can. Mm -hmm. And uh, just like when I read this science uh, paper, and she got excited and she started working with me. Now we actually get money for this. Now we, uh, after uh, a few you know, years, she figured out use these sort of nanofibers materials to turn stem cells, even embryonic stem cells, into osteoblasts by over time that you can do that. So she published a few papers, and uh, she eventually went to the uh, University of Texas in Houston, medical center as a faculty member there. And uh, that's what some of the materials, nanofiber structure, can turn a lot of things that we didn't know. Now we start thinking of mimic this uh, sort of bone, because bone not only have organic materials, but also inorganic minerals in there. <coughs> Maybe the minerals play something. Again, just out of uh, you know, blue, we're thinking maybe minerals would be important. So we started to design composite materials, the polymers with the minerals. Again, this sort of paper now is cited for many, many times, like 900 or something. But uh, this uh, uh, journal, again, was that impact factor two the journals. And because at that time, that was the best journal we could go. And then we developed ways to grow those minerals on the polymer surface to modify them to enhance ball formation. But by, by the way, we had data show uh, they did improve, but this takes a long time. It takes many days to grow those minerals, all those nanofibers. Then we had recently, like 10 years or a few years ago, that we had this postdoc who told me that he, he had some very strong uh, background in electrical chemistry. Then I thought maybe with the electrical field can help uh, this deposition of minerals. Then we set up this sort of uh, electrodes and then put polymers in between them, try to grow those minerals. But surprisingly, it was indeed very fast. I, as I showed you, 22 days, now turned into one hour. One hour, we can grow a large amount of minerals out of those polymers. But not only we grow the minerals, but we grow the really pretty minerals. Look at that one. <laughs> right? This is a control. <laughs> then we can also grow some other minerals, you know. But you can imagine, you probably saw some control like those. So basically, by control, those different sort of voltages, different temperatures, and so forth, they lead to different nuclei, uh, nucleation process and the growth process. And ended up, you have different crystal structures. And then that can control actually the degradation of those uh, calcium uh, containing uh, minerals. Then in such a way, we can control calcium sort of release. 
and that affect osteoblasts. So we are part of that study now is working on how calcium can affect uh, uh, 3D tissue growth. Now this was uh, like a composite, not just a web polymer making this uh, architectural changes, but then we started doing delivery system to see how biological factors can be utilized into this 3D structure, further guide stem cell differentiation. So again, we publish a lot of those areas, uh, just not try to ask you to read uh, any of them, but uh, uh, show that we have done a lot. Now, we made the scaffold, then made those nanoparticles or microparticles, then you cover them into the scaffold in such a way different growth factors are in different spheres. Now, some of them are released early, some are released later, try to mimic the developmental process of tissue uh, formation. And uh, in such a way, so we have students work out these spheres, make the uh, uh, and, uh, incorporate into those uh, power structure of the nanofibers, and then release them. So this was uh, some earlier one. Then we show BMP, if we incorporate in there, we can form better bone uh, compared to control. So this uh, laser doesn't work that well. And, uh, and similarly, if you control PDGF release, then we can get a large amount of uh, blood vessel formation. And that's what's very important for a variety of tissues, not just for uh, uh, bone, but many others. So this was some of the benefit we got from the incorporate the change not only the structures, but the release factors in such a sort of scaffold. Now we start thinking, is making all this 3D construct. Either way, we make nanofibers or make composite or release factors. We still make a 3D construct. Put in patients, we need open surgery to implant them in there. And maybe for many of the things that you prefer something in, uh, less than invasive, like injection, get them in rather than, so we are thinking of how to inject nanofibers in there. Then we start to synthesize new polymers. So again, it's polyleptic kind of polymer because it's FDA approved, but we grow them into a star-shaped polymer. You know, stars can do a lot of things better than others, right? So we start making the star polymers. Then these star polymers can self-assemble when you stir them in a solution, the self sample into not only the nanofiber structure, but into those spheres, hollow spheres. In such a way, you have these pores that cells can easily grow in, but also can grow outside, either in or out, they are grow out of nanofibers. Now they're injectable, can be easily delivered into defect uh, in patients. And uh, then we put this into patient uh, animals and repair uh, cartilage. Now you see this complete cartilage repair over time. Now you see this very strong staining. And this was the gels people use. So this is a sort of a, another control. So we're much better than that. The mechanical properties, now you can see the mechanical properties reach exactly the same as the rabbit cartilage. So this is getting us closer to clinical application because as I told you, 40% of the mechanical property people thought was too good to be true. Now it's totally too good to be true. So then we publish something higher impact factor into this better than those two. And uh, now those are the repaired cartilage in rabbit, you can see. The very smooth surface, uh, thick cartilage in this area, you see the high resolution, you see high quality cartilage. So this was uh, some of the uh, materials that made. Now we got excited to understand, because it was a totally surprise for me, was they formed this hollow structure. I was thinking of make spheres, but not thinking of make hollow spheres. They form hollow spheres. I didn't understand why that was the case. Uh, then we started a stu study on this try to see by changing this star shape, either longer branches or more branches on them to see how that affect everything. And uh, then do this sort of uh, uh, emulsion process to make spheres. Then we can make different spheres. You can see this. Then we found was the increase the number of branches, you get more and more porous. You increase the fiber length, uh, the molecular uh, length of those arms, 
you get the more and more like solid structure. But control those two, you can get both nanofiber structure and those hollow structure. Or even we found you can make them into spongy structures, multiple pores in there. And then I got very excited. I thought, okay, so now we found something that's probably can go into simulation because you can see both uh, uh, Sharon and uh, uh, Ron mentioned the simulation design so far. Because I thought, if you understand the process, then we can tailor any structures into these sort of spheres. Then I thought was that with the star shaped polymer, then the difference was we had some end groups. You see the green dots show those end groups. Then the metal, we also have some functional groups in there. And maybe those end groups matter, but I had sort of a lot of discussion with the postdoc at that time. Uh, he didn't agree with me, but anyway, so we started doing this. And one of the uh, graduate students who did this was Jian Pan, who was the uh, main person who did these studies. What he did was use this chemistry to show when well, you have this hydroxyl group there, and uh, now, if you react with these molecules, then the hydroxy group is kept. So that we lost that functional group. Then you get a polymer like this. Now, to see if this can still form them, then you can see on that side. When you have this end group in there, then we have this porous structure. But once you get that end group knocked out, they don't form that hollow structure. So, so indeed, that end group actually matters. Now similarly, we can do the other way. If you increase the end group, then they change from not sort of a hollow structure into hollow structure, or hollow structure into, we call it the sort of spongy structures, multiple pores, and so forth. So we, we see the phenomena. Then I talked to uh, Sharon about this. I said, can we do some simulation, make this faster, publish uh, you know, some good journals to, to show this was true. And uh, for her, it was uh, sort of she come up with a few equations. And uh, then we got this simulation going. Now you see it's with certain structures with the low, no hydroxyl group, and the group are very low hydroxyl group. You never form the hollow structure. Then let's go back. Then if you increase that uh, end groups, they form stable hollow structure. If you further increase them, then they form this spongy, you have a lot of bubbles inside. They, they form the spongy structure. In such a way that we know by tailor those hydroxyl groups, we can get whatever structure we want. It. So you can get not hollow, you can get hollow, you can get the spongy. So this was the publication that we have. Uh, Dr. Glosser, uh, and uh, Ryan was the person did the simulation uh, with us, so also with uh, uh, Ron Arson's group. So this was uh, publishing uh, advanced materials, although we, we are aiming higher than that, but uh, this was a great journal. Anyway, so then we start thinking of uh, how to apply those. So now we are working on this for heart regeneration, for our two, three generation, or for many other uh, regeneration project. Yeah, but this is just an example, because in the dental school, those dental students are, are only interested in teeth. And they want to regenerate teeth. And as well, the students that worked with me was try to get stem cell from the wisdom tooth. And then you can get the stem cell inside, and then mix with those spheres, and then you inject back to repair the tissue. So you, some of you may have this experience, you have tooth pain. It's really painful, but you just can't scratch them because they're inside this harsh shell, right? Then what dentists do, they just drill a hole, take everything out, so the so nerves, all the tissues are removed, so you don't have pain anymore. What they do again is put some dead materials, polymers or other stuff, put in there, then close it and with metals, and uh, then you don't have pain. And, uh, but those materials are dead materials and are not able to repair. Over time, they become more fragile, discolored, and so forth. So it's better to have a limit thing. So the, after they did the surgery, what the, the students showed me was that, you see, with this, then we can grow some tissues inside, like the natural tissue. And if we treat them with hypoxia, then we can get some vascularized tissue. So in such a way, a lot of advantage. 
So where are the advantages that you can have pain again? <laughs> there will be pain for again, right? But uh, it's a living tissue. It's, uh, then I want to talk another delivery system. So this was not about uh, North Korea. <laughs> this is a, we call two-stage delivery system for microRNA. And microRNA was like uh, discovered in 1993, first microRNA. And then seven years later, the second microRNA. So you can imagine from then to now, after a few seven years later, we should have uh, a dozens of microRNA but there are thousands of microRNAs now, and because those are very important, and uh, now how to deliver them into cells is very challenging, how to do that. The, one of the things people do is using this sort of lipofactory, it's basically liposome structures. You have a, this lipid bio-layer similar to cell structure. You can put this microRNA in there, then this uh, bio-layer or similar to the cell bio-layer in the membrane. So they fuse together, then get this thing into the cells. Uh, but this is very unstable. So in vivo application is challenging. In vivo is fine, in vivo is challenging. So then we develop a polymer that, uh, again, this hyper-branched polymer, and then they form this hollow structure, and, uh, like uh, here. So from this hollow structure, this is microRNA. Then we can deliver them very efficiently into cells, but very low toxicity. And then we further, because these are polymers are very stable, so we're able to put into uh, control to release micro or nano spheres, like this pink one. That's a sphere, contain a lot of those nano delivery system. Then we immobilize them or immobilize them into this 3D scaffold. And so in such a way that this can control to release this particle, and this particle can continuously deliver those microRNA into cells. In such a way, we avoid use any viruses, but it can achieve long-term, uh, high efficient uh, sort of a transfection into cells. So now we ended up showed these results is that when we put these materials into the defect, then with the microRNA delivered, the, the defect is totally repaired. You look at here, over long-term delivery. Short-term delivery didn't function that well. But this one, we didn't put any cells. So the story started with use specific cell to repair tissues. Later on, use stem cell, but control them into the uh, specific uh, sort of tissue, then repair them. Here, with no cells, just the materials. I think this is very exciting for material scientists. We can do this thing without biologists to repair tissues, right? So you can have materials and deliver a molecules that repair tissues, and because this turn on the endogenous stem cells to repair them. And then this is another of those examples we did. So we divide the materials that can layer by layer release molecules like a PTH that's can stimulate ball formation. And uh, so this was published in biomaterials, but uh, was selected by uh, this journal called Science, Translational Science, uh, Medicine, as their uh, editor's choice. So I thought, why we didn't think of this journal to submit? And uh, we always submit to biomaterials journals. But the excitement was that, again, we just designed this uh, release system into 3D and they can totally repair the ball defect and over time without putting any cells in there. This makes this translation now closer because if you manipulate stem cell outside of body, then you inject into uh, human patients, the FDA approval process is much more complicated because you manipulate cells. If the cells change into something, when you put back, what will be the potential negative effect down the road in 20 years, you prove it. It's be a lot of work to do. And then if you use only materials, I think that's will lead to uh, faster, hopefully, translation. So again, I want to thank the uh, resources that I got. So eventually, I should decide to support us. So we actually primarily supported by uh, NIH over the years. And uh, uh, thank you very much. If there are questions, we'll be happy to have answer.